organizing this webinar series um, in collaboration with our partner, the Indonesian Heritage Society. Um, so as has been the tradition, we've always asked the Indonesian Heritage Society to do our welcome remarks. And this afternoon, we have Ms. Ayla Winarto to do our welcome remarks. Ayla was the former president of the Indonesian Heritage Society and is now the advisor to the board of the Heritage Society and a great supporter of this webinar series. So please kindly, Ayla, we give the floor to you. Okay, thank you so much, Chrissy. I almost feel like asking you to get up and dance. That was very jazzy introductory music. But thank you very much, uh, everyone, and uh, Selamat Siang, uh, the Indonesian Heritage Society here in Jakarta. Now, um, as Chrissy has said, uh, this series uh, called Kaleidoscope Changing Patterns is um, being organised in uh, collaboration uh, between Indonesian Heritage Society and uh, Meet the Makers. And as one of the committee members, I must say I'm very heartened at the, the great support that people like yourselves have given this series. We're now in the fifth webinar out of uh, a series of 10. And um, for those of you who are not aware, the purpose of these seminars is to promote a deep appreciation and awareness of Indonesian crafts and to keep alive the works of the many Indonesian artisans yeah, uh, who have been facing challenges during this uh, pandemic. Our session today uh, features weavings. And I know that many of you um, on this session uh, very uh, interested in textiles in general. And you will agree with me that the traditional textiles of Indonesia are amongst the finest in the world. But today we're gonna to focus on the Molo indigenous group from Timur Tengah Selatan. And you'll hear how these uh, wonderful women have taken the brave steps to preserve their region's identity using weaving in a rather unique way yeah, to, pr uh, to protect their customary land. Through this session, what we, we encourage you to do is to look beyond the colours, the motives and the techniques of these uh, weavings and to appreciate their historical significance, yeah? And I'm sure you'll find this uh, session very moving. So without further ado, let's get started, Chrissy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ibu Ayla. Um, and to start us with some introductions about this webinar series, I invite um, Meet the Makers founder, uh, Ibu Nia Fliam, um, to give us a bit of introduction. She is herself a batik artist based in Yogyakarta. Good afternoon. Thank you to everyone for joining the Meet the Makers Kaleidoscope Changing Patterns webinar series. Thank you to the Indonesian Heritage Society in joining us in this initiative to support the continuing traditions of Indonesian culture, particularly in the field of craft as art. The global pandemic has made annual fairs of Meet the Makers impossible for this year, and many artisans are struggling because of the impact this has had on their craft. We hope that with these webinars, we can contribute to the lives and livelihoods of our partner artisans by continuing to honor their work through these talks. Please know that 100% of your contribution will go directly to the artisans themselves. We hope you enjoy the webinar today. As this is only our fifth webinar, we are still learning and making improvements for the next sessions. Please bear with us. I turn over to Chris, who will explain to you guidelines about the webinar, and she will also introduce our moderator. Thank you, Nia. Um, so that was about our webinar, and so that our web webinar will run smoothly. Our moderator is Ms. Grace Tan Johannes. She is a journalist with works published in Our Better World, South China Morning Post, Jakarta Globe, and an Indonesian and, and Indonesia expat. As a Rotinese weaver's urban great-granddaughter, Grace is passionate about reconstructing her family's lost cultural knowledge by telling stories of other handloom weavers across Indonesia. She has also written herself a story featuring Molo handloom weaving earlier this year. Thank you, Grace, for agreeing to moderate this session, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Chrissy. And I would like to welcome everyone to the fifth edition of the Meet the Makers Indonesian Heritage Society webinar. 
Today, our theme is Molo Timorese Handloom Weaving and the Guardians of Identity. Mama Aleta's presentation will be in Indonesian, and as mentioned by Chris, uh, Chrissy before, it will be interpreted in real time. And um, my name is Grace Tan Johannes. Um, tonight, sorry, today we will be learning about um, Molo Timorese um, handloom weaving traditions and their important roles for establishing the Molo Timorese identity. Please stay tuned until the end of the webinar for opportunities to view beautiful handwoven products by Mama Aleta's uh, collective and uh, support a great cause. All proceeds will go to uh, the weavers and the artisans themselves. And uh, there will also be updates for upcoming Meet the Makers events and uh, an opportunity to take a photo together. So these stories that we will be hearing today uh, will be told by two remarkable women that I have tremendous respect for. The first is Mama Aleta Baun, uh, affectionately referred to as Mama Aleta, and she's best known as the woman who peacefully stopped the marble mining industry in her hometown, Fatukoto, with the power of handloom weaving. The second one is scholar Siti Maimuna and founder of the Mama Aleta Fund, joining us from the University of Passau, Germany. Let us watch this film, Molo, Wim Molo Women Weaving Sustainability by Meet the Makers. Molo is an indigenous territory in Timor Island, East Nusa Tenggara. It is located at the foot of Mount Wadi's karst area, which encircles three kingdoms, namely Molo, Amanatun, and Amanuban. For the Molo people, there is a philosophy that they hold for their life. The earth is our body, stone is our bones, water is our blood, land is our flesh, and forests and grasses is our arteries and hair. 90% of the Molo people are farmers, ranchers, and planters. They subsistently depend on rainwater. Nature is their guide for life. In 2006, hundreds of weavers blocked the marble mining that destroyed the environment. With their weaving loom, they weave non-stop until the company set back. Aleta Baun is the prominent leader. She led the fight to protect their customary land and preservation of nature. Aleta Baun has also established a working group called Atai Mamus to organize indigenous community in Tiga Batu Tungku to protect their customary forest. Oh, my God. 
For Molo women, we think it's a sign of women's maturity. A woman is allowed to marry if she is able to make clothes for herself and for the family. In the land of Molo, weaving is also a way to preserve Nausus and Anjav. They are stones that hold history of the origin of the Molo indigenous people. They develop and manage weaving groups in Timur Tengah Selatan district to preserve weaving and nature, as well as helping the economy of the people to overcome protection issues. We are also wrecked by long dry season that has made it difficult to grow crops. What we do to survive is to keep weaving and selling it to the city. Despite of the condition, we still remain optimistic to protect our nature and preserve our culture. We don't want to sell what we cannot make. Saya mempersembahkan penghargaan ini kepada masyarakat adat Molo, Amanatun, dan Amanuban di Timur Tengah Selatan, dan juga kepada para pendukung kami, upaya mereka melakukan secara bersama-sama dan tidak mengenal lelah untuk menjaga alam telah menguatkan saya untuk terus maju. When Aleta Baun was awarded the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2013, she donated part of the money to establish Mama Aleta Fund. The mission of the fund is to identify and help other women who struggle to protect their livelihood and environment. All right. Our first speaker today is Mama Aleta Baun, joining us from Timor. Following her success in closing the mining industry in Molo, Mama Aleta was a recipient of the 2013 Goldman Environmental Prize and the 2016 Yap Tiam Hin Prize, which supported her efforts to map her ancestral homeland um, to protect it from future extractive industries such as mining. A productive traditional handloom weaver herself, Mama Aleta is the founder of Organisasi Atamaimus, also known as uh, Pokja Oat Working Group, which support, sorry, which, which promotes uh, natural resource conservation, uh, sustainable farming, gender equality and empowerment, and rural business opportunities. She is also a member of the founding board of the NGO Pikul, which promotes sustainable farming in Timor. Uh, board, and she is also a board member of AMAN, the Alliance for the Indigenous Peoples of Indonesia. And she is also a, formal, a former member of the Nusa Tenggara Timur uh, Provincial Parliament. Let us welcome Mama Aleta. Uh, terima kasih. Saya akan menyampaikan dalam bahasa Indonesia materi saya tentang perempuan merajut benang. Bagaimana perempuan uh, perempuan di Molo atau di Timor itu mereka uh, mengumpulkan benang uh, urat demi urat karena empat faktor tersebut akan mendukung mereka untuk uh, bisa melakukan kegiatan baik itu kegiatan tenun, kegiatan pertanian dan peternakan. Kalau salah satu faktor yang hilang, maka sebagai perempuan dan sebagai masyarakat adat tidak bisa bekerja dengan baik. Oleh karena itu, filosofi orang Timur sebenarnya bahwa tidak terlepas daripada uh, kekayaan alam yang ada. Perempuan sangat dekat dengan alam. Kenapa perempuan sangat dekat dengan alam? Karena perempuan menemukan kapas dari bagian alam dan kapas ini adalah dari alam dan uh, ditemukan oleh kaum perempuan dan ini adalah semak yang perempuan uh, berkesempatan untuk belajar, bagaimana mereka belajar di hutan. Bahan pewarna uh, berasal dari alam untuk mengenal bahan 
pewarna perempuan harus bersahabat dengan alam. Jadi mereka uh, harus setiap hari melakukan kegiatan di alam sehingga mereka bisa menemukan pewarna. Tapi lebih banyak uh, mereka juga dekat dengan air. Yang berikut alat untuk pintal ben benang ini di dibeli dari alam, eh, diambil dari alam. Jadi eh, alam sebenarnya bersahabat dengan manusia karena banyak bahan dan alat berwarna ini semua ditemukan di alam. Perempuan al dan eh, alam eh, tenun itu sama-sama bekerja sama sehingga menghasilkan sesuatu yang berguna bagi tubuh manusia yaitu eh, kain tenun itu sendiri. Ya, jadi eh, tenun bersejarah dari turun temurun. Jadi tenun yang dilakukan oleh para perempuan ini adalah melanjutkan sejarah dari leluhur, sejarah di mana perempuan bersahabat dengan alam, perempuan bekerja di alam, perempuan setiap hari harus bolak-balik di alam dan mereka belajar dan setelah itu mereka melanjutkan kegiatan tenun itu. Maka tenun adalah menurut mereka bersejarah. Identitas perempuan dilambangkan sebagai penenun. Karena eh, kenapa identitas mereka dilambangkan sebagai penenun? Karena kalau dari kecil sampai perempuan sudah mulai eh, sekolah, dia juga harus bagaimana belajar tentang tenun. Bagaimana dia harus eh, mulai mengenal benang, mengenal pewarna, mengenal alat, dan juga melakukan kegiatan tenun. Sehingga ketika dia sudah Uh, tahu menenun, maka dia juga boleh menikah, dia boleh berumah tangga. Uh, perempuan mempersiapkan alat tenun. Perempuan mempersiapkan alat tenun ini berasal dari alam. Uh, seperti ini. Jadi alat-alat tenun yang dilakukan oleh perempuan itu dari alam. Atis adalah penjepit. Dua bagian kayu yang menjepit. Itu mencari terangkan tentang perempuan dan laki-laki bekerja sama. Bagaimana mereka harus dua-dua bekerja sama untuk menjepit kain itu untuk menjadi sesuatu yang kuat. Sehingga ketika mereka membuat kain tenun, kain tenun itu langsung kuat. Kuat itu karena ada jepitan. Jepitan itu dilapangkan sebagai perempuan dan laki-laki. Bekerja sama untuk menguatkan diri dalam proses menenun. Yang berikut adalah senu. Senu itu alat pemotong. Bagaimana e, menjahit dua benang yang menjadi dua benang atas dan bawah. Benang atas dan bawah ini sebenarnya e, dilambangkan sebagai perempuan dan laki-laki. Jadi ada saat-saat tertentu perempuan harus e, apa, melakukan e, pemimpin, dia harus memimpin. Dan ada juga saat-saat tertentu laki-laki harus memimpin. Jadi tidak selamanya kepala rumah tangga itu adalah laki-laki atau e, pemimpin itu adalah laki-laki. Tetapi perempuan juga bisa karena itu sudah mencari perangkat di dalam alat tenun. Nah, kuat ini e, sebenarnya untuk memisahkan benang atas dan benang bawah untuk e, sili berganti. Jadi e, ada satu alat yang dia bisa memisahkan benang atas dan bawah. Kapan dia harus akad benang dari atas, eh, dari atas sudah, dan harus ganti lagi benang dari bawah. Nah, itu yang akan menentukan siapa yang di atas dan siapa yang eh, di bawah itu adalah eh, yang disebut dengan kuat. Kuat ini sebenarnya menolong kuat supaya bekerja sama. Jadi tidak hanya kuat sendiri atau kuat sendiri, tapi bagaimana dia harus menolong untuk bekerja sama. Sehingga bisa membantu untuk memisahkan benang antara siapa kapan dan siapa yang ada di atas dan siapa yang ada di bawah. Sial sebenarnya menolong ut untuk membantu memisahkan atas dan bawah untuk menentukan eh, panjang dan lebarnya eh, kain tenun itu. Itu sebenarnya ada eh, ada ada motif-motif yang nanti ada tenun-tenun tiga macam tenun yang nanti itu yang menentukan itu adalah sial bahwa kapan dia harus e, membantu ut dan membantu kuat untuk menentukan kepemimpinan itu dan
yang menentukan motif itu yang ada itu adalah nekan. Nekan itu yang sebenarnya dia menentukan panjangnya. Berapa panjang kain tenun itu dan berapa lebarnya kain tenun itu akan ditentukan oleh nekan. Ya, seperti itu. Ya, uh, tenun sebagai identitas. Tenun adalah sebagai identitas, tetapi tenun ini bersejarah. Jadi dia menceritakan semua aktivitas, semua yang dilakukan, ya baik dia menceritakan tentang uh, tentang alam, dia juga berbicara tentang lingkungan, dia juga berbicara tentang struktur dalam satu kelembagaan, dia juga bercerita tentang bagaimana hubungan perempuan dan laki-laki, dan dia juga bercerita tentang keyakinan yang akan uh, mereka yakini. Nah, seperti itu. Tenun bersejarah dan menceritakan tentang alam dan manusia. Seperti dia tidak hanya menceritakan alam. The woven cloth also talks about the relationship between men and women. Not only women uh, have certain roles and men have certain roles, but they help each other. And this is expressed in their weaving. The, this loom woven cloth is something that uh, brings everyone together. This woven cloth brings everyone together to gather in their togetherness, even of different uh, folds, that they should come together to save and pre preserve their shared history. So these different threads come together and these express the history that is happening within the territory of the Molo people. The meaning of this woven cloth. For these Molo people, this is a tool for a campaign or an advocacy tool. People previously didn't know how to read, but they knew how to weave their cloth. And this this woven cloth helped to say a message. The colors that were chosen, the creativity they had, they expressed on their cloth. Also the origins of their ethnic groups are expressed on their cloths and people could identify the identity of the people based on their cloths. This was reflected and mirrored in these cloths. And these cloths are also give messages for the generations that will come. And these people also uh, recognize different materials, different tools and different trees. And if trees are felled, definitely there will be conflict among women because women know that some of these forest species, forest trees are used for materials that are needed for the cloth. So the earth resembles or symbolizes a woman that nurtures and that gives food and gives her all. The, the woven cloth also connects one ethnic group to another ethnic group within its stories. In the motif, you can tell about the borders of territories. But you can also, it also tells about the connections between ethnic groups. So just not about one signal, single ethnic group, but the cloth can tell about other ethnic groups as well. The cloth also tells about the potential that women have. The women are brave to tell stories through this cloth. And they have a strong mission to do this. Because even since before, uh, there wasn't anybody who wrote about history, about nature, about relationships, about the role of women and men 
but the women wrote quote unquote this through their cloths and therefore their potential, their role is very strong and very large. And their knowledge actually, especially about guarding nature was quite strong. And these were expressed in symbols in the motifs on the cloths. To tell about the motifs and to deliver it like paintings on the cloth are quite difficult. So it's something that is should be honored because on the cloth, a whole village, the story of a whole village and relationship is delivered and expressed. This cloth also hides the secret. This, the secrets of the customary institutions in their symbols. They hide within their cloth and not so exposed, not in written form, not really campaigning every day about their customary institutions or their adat, but these are expressed in their motifs. The meaning of these motifs, the meanings of the, these, these limits are expressed in the the sky and the earth in order to dig deeper on the potential to study the important things and that are valuable about our ancestors we look for this information and knowledge that have been hidden by in our Astas ancestors. These are hidden in our village. But in general, many women know about this knowledge, especially about knowledge in natural resources, even though they didn't have uh, teachers, but they know this knowledge. This wisdom that they know naturally, that they, that they know and that they have guarded across time. Women also prepare themselves to come into a household that they know very well how to make handloom woven cloth, that they know the meanings of the motives of these cloths. That is how they prepare to become part of a new household. They also understand that they have become part of a new household, they become a leader, a woman becomes a leader. They are accommodated by the culture because they extend history and they extend the stories through their cloths from our ancestors. And this is expressed through the motifs. And while they weave the women help each other. If there are others that don't understand the meaning of the motifs or how to make a motif, then they ask the support of the others. And without anybody asking for any payment or compensation. Within one village, they know how to weave and anyone can access the activity of weaving. How the Molo women choose dyes. White is the color of the sky or the color of the rays of the sun. Uh, white is it from the beginning of time when they didn't have a, 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 a religion that, that this was God, white was God, the source of God. This was also the belief of the women who chose dyes. And black, black is the color of the earth. With different colors that are on the earth, all sorts of colors exist. And that you can make different colors. And that you can develop and 
And with black, you can develop different things. You can also develop livestock and other aspects. Other colors are supportive or complementary colors. Two colors. Uh, where they use different leaves and barks to make other colors. These two colors come together and hold the history of the weaving in women's lives. These dyes come together and unify and become the strength of the cloth. This dye needs water. And water has the color clear white. And actually the sea is the clean water. So if there is dirt that enters the sea, becomes dirty. But in the clear water, there are also those that come from the sea, like the crocodiles. If there are crocodiles in the sea, these crocodiles guard all and all of the richness that is in the sea. The snakes and the fish and all of the richness of the sea is guarded by the crocodile. And these different tribes always express that the sky is clear, also like water, and water is clear and transparent. Uh, we are almost out of time. Is it possible to, to wrap up? The function of the motif. The, this explains the relationship of the humans and uh, nature. The, 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 the cloth tells about the, the history uh, as a water that comes from the forest and also about uh, networks that exist. Thank you, and I will deliver my presentation. Yeah. Good, good morning. My name is Siti Maimuna. I have been um, ordered by my commandant, Mama Aleta Down, uh, about to present. I have always uh, have get new wisdom from Mama Aleta, just like I received in her presentation. I'm a writer. I'm a founder of the Mama Aleta Foundation Fund been writing about women and the woven cloth and socio-ecological aspects and how she's also guarded the identity of the Molo people. Even though we are talking about woven cloth, uh, we're talking about the space, the space of the Amanuban and Amanatun and Molo uh, in the higher ground. And these are the three territories in the district of Timor Tengah Selatan in Isa Tenggara. Known in them since the year 2003. I was introduced by Kakaminja. In a in a in a kitchen with full of, of of steam, and Mama Aleta had just um, delivered a baby, her youngest, Eilina. And I couldn't forget this. She is is in Timor, uh, the youngest uh, ch child. The child when it, when a child is born, she is esteemed, and I couldn't forget this first interaction I had with Mama Mama. Aleta. I have written two books. The first one is about Molo, development and climate change. And the second is weaving in the guardian of identity. But I, I, I see myself more as a note taker. And um, the, the information here is the, 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 the knowledge of the Molo people. So I am just a note taker. I hope I hope that I can express what is happening there. I will have two parts of my presentation. 
This is Mamalasa. The first part is about understanding handloom weaving and understanding handloom weaving as a archive, a socio-ecological archive. And the second is to look at handloom weaving as a tool to protect the identity of the Molo people and to protect nature. Before I go forward, I will be sharing a short film, but the music isn't really clear. But this is for those who want to feel like in, you're in the Molo land. So this is a short film of how it is in the Molo land. Molo is in Timor Tengah Selatan. It's quite far. But if we look at this uh, picture, what is a characteristic is this rock mountain. What the what the government has said is, and the local people said is, this is a marble mountain. So imagine that we are here on top of this rock mountain. So I'm going to talk more about looking at your, your the body of the woman as a socio-ecological text or like a script that communicates a message. Our body is a social text, a narrative, a social can be said to be a social ecological narrative. And that she express that that she do it, and the things that the body expresses, like like this woven cloth. And there are three um, main words in English to discuss it: the state of being, belonging, and becoming. So the state of being of how a a, a woman exists in making her cloth. The second of belonging is the space or the territory where she exists and how policies can affect her body and how she responds. That is a that is the, the becoming and the state of becoming. So from the author Lara Sati, she looks at how the woman's body is a an archive, not of books, but an archive of, of, of methods and a way to look deeper into the cloths. We look at how um, women are affected by their experience, by their psychology, by the existing uh, moral, moral morality that is being uh, used and is present there. If we interview a woman that is 60 years old, other people will, will choose other people instead of this woman also about the relation between humans and non-humans and also animals. Uh, these are also like life aspects of the Molo people and their belief system, their cosmology, about their farming, about the division of labor. So delving deeper into the cloth and this body of, of being and becoming, they also are responsible for several things of planting. But women are also responsible for domestic work and reproductive work. Also gathering water, cooking and washing. And even in the past time, to make many cloths to protect the body from extreme weather conditions. Very, very hot, hot weather especially in Entete. And with this kind of multiple burden or double burden on the shoulder of these women, her knowledge and her skill and her creativity in weaving is still there. She's able to cultivate the cotton, diversify the color and create various patterns despite the multi tasks that she has to undertake. So, and you can see the territory and even the geography from the patterns that are woven. For example, in the Amanatuan, Amanatuan women, they like to make more patterns that have the Gewang tree. The Gewang tree is a korifa, it's a palm, which is found in their coasts, uh, versus the Mola women who like to make lotus patterns. So these aspects influence a woman in making this cloth. 
Now, how does this geographic setting, this space, this cultural setting, this religion, this local setting that is a social construct, and how does it affect this woman? Also, especially, how come only women are the ones who make or handwoven cloths? These are markers, marks of how the, the body or the woman adjusts herself, responds to these different factors, these different changes. There are also sayings that if a man will choose to weave, he might become impotent. So there are these beliefs and factors. There, there are also beliefs, uh, depending on where you are from, that this can also affect your sense of belonging and ex influence your a woman's a weaver's mindset. Uh, this is an example where I uh, met Maria Salan. She would still weave uh, cotton from spun cotton. She would share how her mother, her mother, she would use the threads from the shop, but her mom used the spun cotton. And she would tell about her mom, about the black and white that was, the colors that was spoken of Mama Aleta earlier. But Mar Maria Selan would talk about the, the factory threads. And now um, the space for women to become more educated is there. And now there is there are less people who are focusing on the tenun because the more educated you are, the farther you are, the less you can learn about this local tradition and about the skill and the capacity. So Maria Selan's daughter, Melissa Darmais, she stopped weaving. She only made one um, shoulder cloth and then stopped weaving. She got married. So she asks other people to weave if she needs uh, it needs some cloth for whatever purposes. And now she stays in the city. So there are different situations in these four generations. How their space, their setting, uh, different fact factors have, and their education has influenced their the continuity of their weaving tradition. And now I speak about becoming, and this more looks about the aspect of the dynamics of social, political, and economic aspects that are all constantly changing. How do you know about the local religion? What do you think about the local religion? And what about the subsistence economy? And how, how has that been set aside for the market economy? And finally, how the climate, the changing climate, is also affecting our livelihoods and women have to adjust and change and become resilient. And here is the perspective that uh, Mama Alet had, had said, so that nature will change if it is forced to change because of destruction. Uh, this is in the time of Suharto that there were, this, the savannas uh, were changed and were planted because the government said that it had to be part of a regreening program. When the savanna was the natural lay of the land since before, since time immemorial. So they were they planted with only one species and it became a plantation and a government project. And this has actually become a problem, um, especially for their cattle raising uh, 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 livelihood because they're not able to come here to, to feed on grass and this has affected the livelihood negatively. Also during that time there was a concession, a mining concession that was given in this area. Uh, if you know about this case previously, about a trillion rupees amount, this case, but I would like to um, close this presentation by saying that, that women in their bodies and in what they express are themselves archives, like libraries of knowledge, of methods, of understanding. Within her and as she expresses herself, she makes the memory of the Molo people present today. So we shouldn't just see this piece of cloth about as, as, as just some object. And we also should avoid romanticism of and tradition that this is a, just 
a, a beautiful piece or that this is a piece of tradition, but that women are growing and changing and that their knowledge is also changing, but they continue to bring their knowledge through these different situations that women um, go through. And it becomes a way of decolonizing knowledge. I want others to know about this. So looking at the dimensions of the women and their body and their expression as an archive, to see how she is responding to, to events in reality, like this one, when they uh, defended their land against the marble mining. And they strengthened their resolve that nature is part of their identity. The rock is part of their body, is part of their bone. And even the name of Mama Aleta, Baun, means, has a special meaning. So these meanings and this relation and this strength between nature and people was reinforced during these times. So the government just saw the mineral underneath the land and they didn't see the tradition, the people, the wealth of, of the culture that existed. So in the evening in 2006, they tried to, to come together and they brought their uh, handloom weaves to stop the operations of mining. So they even did planting in agriculture in other places so, so they could get money so that they continued their, their, their advocacy, their protest here against the marble mining. During this time, they also shared their stories of struggles and their stories and they, 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 they guarded their spirit and they raised their spirit by being a, by preparing a festival. And that these, this wisdom uh, should be recognized. Should, and that what is most important, they, they've developed a, ma a mantra that we will not sell anything that we don't make, that we don't make from our own land, that we don't make from our own hands. And this is a mantra that was important for the award that Mama Aleta won. Pers the, pers the perspective of the Molo people was picked up by the media in the US because life is made by God. Now, from the, win from the, the award that Mama Aleta won, uh, she then developed, she donated uh, three fourths of her winnings to to set up the uh, foundation, the Mama Aleta Fund Foundation, to support the women that are, are, you know, protecting the land, using their local wisdom. There are four programs. Uh, that, this is the supporting the women leaders. There is a second program, Blue Bus, that supports the young, so that they can also record and document. Then uh, men and women can also receive uh, support uh, through the Olive Tataf. And the fourth program is um, a, a, a support for meetings and public occasions where there can be exchange on the defense of land. Finally, finally, I'm playing this last film to end and to lead us into our next session. I would like to um, ask some questions then. I will ask these questions in Bahasa. Um, I will ask these questions in English first before translating into Bahasa Indonesia. Um, pertanyaan yang pertama untuk Mama Aleta. Um, how are weavers affected by COVID-19? Um, as we all know, handwoven cloth is uh, usually something marketed to tourists. So when tourists are hardly coming to where you are, uh, how do you sell your goods? Terima kasih atas pertanyaan it, uh, tersebut. Saya uh, dalam akan menjawab, tetapi dalam COVID-19 uh, uh, ini 
para perempuan lebih banyak melakukan kegiatan aktivitas di rumah karena eh, transportasi dibatasi, perkumpulan juga dibatasi sehingga banyak perempuan melakukan kegiatan lebih banyak melakukan kegiatan tenun. Tenun ini tidak bisa jual kemana-mana karena tidak bisa e, berjalan kemana-mana. Jadi tenun yang mereka lakukan, mereka tenun saja dan menyimpan tenun itu. Dan ekonomi mereka sangat buruk sekali. Karena mereka tidak bisa kemana-mana dan mereka tidak melakukan akses untuk e, jualan. Dan juga untuk e, bersama-sama ke pasar atau ke tempat e, yang ramai. Nah, ini sebenarnya menyulitkan kaum perempuan untuk mendapat uh, biaya ekonomi. Dan juga dengan uh, sebenarnya tidak hanya an ancaman COVID, tetapi ancaman uh, perubahan iklim juga mengancam uh, masyarakat, dan khususnya kaum perempuan yang sebenarnya bekerja sebagai ibu rumah tangga dan bekerja sebagai petani. Baik. Terima kasih Mama Aleta. Oke, okay. ya ini pertanyaan dari Ibu Genevieve Dugan. Um, uh, by among the Molo people, I think this uh, presentation could have been a good introduction to all groups of weavers, traditional weavers in uh, NTT at least, or perhaps in other uh, areas in, um, in uh, Indonesia. So they have so many things in common. Oh. I have a question regarding ecology. I think the group of Molo weavers is 700 or something like that weavers wow. or dyer, correct? And yes. uh, how do they manage the ecology, the respect of the environment and using resource of nature to do their dyes? Because I see on other parts using just the, for the red dyes, for example, they have to replant, etc. It's very difficult. And with the dry season or the drought, it is uh, difficult to uh, get uh, keep the quality of the indigo dyes, for example. Uh, baik, terima kasih. Jadi uh, kalau kalau para perempuan di Molo itu uh, sebenarnya wilayah Molo itu ada di hulu. Uh, hulu itu berarti wilayah uh, tangkapan air, uh, penangga air. Jadi uh, banyak pohon-pohon uh, yang besar yang sebenarnya masih bisa bertahan pada musim panas, misalnya uh, mengkudu. Mengkudu itu uh, masih bisa bertahan panas. Tetapi kalau nila itu tidak ber, tidak bisa tahan panas. Jadi ketika uh, musim kemarau, nila itu pasti akan kering. Dan daun kacang hutan, arbila hutan itu juga pasti hilang. Apa yang akan dilakukan oleh kaum perempuan di sana? Mereka uh, pada musim uh, adanya daun-daun itu, daun hijau, uh, semak-semak itu, para perempuan me melakukan kegiatan pencelupan warna uh, biru dan warna hijau, uh, sehingga uh, pada saat musim kemarau dan itu tidak ada, warna itu sudah, sudah banyak yang mereka lakukan. Ada juga yang buat kering, mengeringkan uh, pewarna ta, uh, nila itu. Jadi uh, bagaimana dia membuat untuk jadi gumpalan besar dan setelah itu dikeringkan pada musim uh, kemarau. Nah, uh, pewarna itu sebenarnya uh, ada, ada juga pewarna uh, kimia, ada juga pewarna alam. Nah. Uh, ada lumpur juga pada saat musim uh, hujan itu banyak lumpur yang mereka pakai untuk pewarna juga untuk warna hitam atau biru itu mereka pakai lumpur. Nah pewarna-pewarna ini mereka siapkan sebelum uh, di dalam musim uh, hujan dan ketika musim kemarau itu masih ada persediaan untuk kaum perempuan kaum perempuan untuk uh, menenun. Uh, generasi yang sekarang ini kita lagi upaya untuk bagaimana mereka harus mulai sadar untuk belajar belajar kembali karena uh, prosesnya agak panjang kalau untuk mengeringkan nilai itu sebenarnya proses 3-4 bulan baru dia bisa kering 
I think this question will be for uh, Mai. And um, this question would be, um, why, is, why is there a tendency for Timorese women to lose interest in weaving once they become educated or have opportunities uh, to work elsewhere, even if um, elsewhere is um, uh, doing minimal wage work in countries like, um, uh, in faraway countries like Saudi Arabia or Malaysia? And what kind of policies do you think need to be in place if we want to encourage uh, educated Timorese women to continue practice weaving? Cara menenun, pengetahuan tentang menenun itu kan uh, dia tidak dipraktekkan dalam satu waktu begitu. Jadi uh, mulai dari misalnya uh, dalam suasana malam bercerita, tenun itu satu paket pengetahuan tidak hanya tenun saja, tetapi bagaimana memahami kehidupan dan seterusnya begitu ya. Sehingga uh, orang tua dan anak, jadi reproduksi sosial apa itu uh, terjadi. Pada saat yang lama termasuk prakteknya dimulai dengan misalnya bikin kantong kecil terus apa ikat pinggang begitu terus selendang terus kemudian lebih besar lagi begitu. Child has to live far away because they have to study in another place. If she has to go to higher education and needs to move away. So sometimes she starts learning and then she moves away so that gets cut that learning process gets cut. So this uh, this makes someone think this condition of economy also influences a women to think, and the, in the and the climate change also makes women think about focusing or not on this kind of um, living of this kind of livelihood this kind of skill but if they are not successful of finding jobs in the city then they do come back just like mama aleta and others when seasons change and cannot be predicted then they also try to 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 weave uh, faster so that this can be a source of e their economy as well. So this is how the women are adjusting to other influences and factors. Um, another influence is that it's very easy now to get um, factory made clothes. So before uh, making these hand woven clothes was a necessity for things that they wear and to protect themselves. The government uh, should come out with policies that do not destroy or negatively affect the women's tradition of weaving. And this can be about many things, even if there are policies that affect waters, the water affects how women make color. How, uh, if, if there is mining or if there is impact on the natural resources, this will also affect the livelihood, affect the weaving tradition and the materials that are used. So the women are saying, don't offer concessions again. There is a challenge that, that the government may allow a cement um, concession. They, there was also a policy previously that we thought was a good policy that um, required the government officials to use uh, handwoven cloth. At one side, this is actually a very good, um, uh, very good uh, policy, so that many people would continue wearing these cloths. But then everyone started to prep to make more of these cloths, and then more people outside of the Molo territory were starting to make it, and then factories and other islands started to make it to answer the demand of this policy. So sometimes they would just buy the those from outside because they were cheaper. So, so how can policies protect the space of women, the space for women? How can this be protected so that they may continue with their weaving tradition? If in the village, all the motifs are made by the women, 
all have different meanings, each motif. But if there are products from the outside that are copy pasted uh, copies of this motifs, uh, we don't feel comfortable about it. More people would want to buy those from outside that are copied than those from our village that have the story behind them. But, so if the tourists are just buying but not really interested in the story and they just want to cut up our, our cloths, the, we want to say that there are motifs that aren't allowed to be cut up. Sometimes designers do this because these motifs have stories and histories and even part of our language is in these motifs. And this is very close to our belief in the earth and in God. All right. Um... Sorry, if there are no more questions, maybe I will ask um, this. Um, I will ask this question again uh, to Mama Aleta. Um, ada pertanyaan dari saya untuk Mama Aleta. Um, the question is: How is the practice of spinning cotton and vegetable dyeing uh, affecting the arrival of commercial threads and chemical dyes? And how do you encourage your weavers to um, go the natural way? Uh, are there any uh, incentives uh, there? Pertanyaannya Mama Aleta yaitu uh, bagaimana um, uh, praktek pintal benang dan warna alam ini terpengaruh dengan adanya benang toko dan uh, pewarna-pewarna sintetis. Lalu um, bagaimana uh, penenun-penenun dalam kelompok mama ini uh, mendapatkan dorongan untuk um, kembali ke cara-cara alami. Ya, yeah. uh, sebenarnya uh, pengaruh besar ketika ada ada produk dari toko, benang-benang berasal dari toko. threads from the stores that are of synthetic dyes. This affects very much our traditional weaving because the spinning of um of our cotton actually takes a long time and it shouldn't be during the midday it should be in the night time so it can take three to six days before they finish the spinning of the cotton and after they spin the cotton then they start looking for the leaves of these wood of these trees the roots and the bark so that they can make natural dyes and after they make dyes be, then they can only start in the weaving process so sometimes it takes even two years before they finish one piece of cloth but why does it take so long because in the, the spinning process is long so when the commercial threads uh, come, especially those from China, this really affects our process. So people uh, are, find it easier to weave and uh, get income faster. But why is it important to come back to our, to our natural cotton so that people know because when they use the natural dyes, when they use the commercial dyes in uh, colder climates, you cannot, it doesn't keep a person warm. Uh, furthermore, that uh, commercial thread uh, also uh, is not very strong, doesn't last long and breaks down faster. That is our belief. But if they don't come back to use the natural dyes, but then government will believe that this earth is not useful, useful for those for those that live here, like us women. But then, so we believe that our early knowledge about nature 
and nature gives us knowledge about the colors. And these natural dyes is more important than this synthetic dye. Why is it more important? It doesn't fade, it doesn't, but it can stay longer. When they make, when they make the color, they wash the cloth several times. But when they use the commercial dyes, it will fade quickly or bleed quickly. So, so the, the color is bright, but the color won't last long. It will not last, that bright color will not last for a long, long time, unlike the natural color, which will be years and years before it breaks down. To, uh, close the Q&A session and uh, before giving uh, the floor to the speakers again to for their closing remarks I would like to give a brief recap of um, the presentation that um, they presented us earlier. Mama Aleta explained how handloom weaving is not just uh, a functional piece of cloth but it is also an instrument for recording Timorese knowledge, history, and relationship with the natural world. The skill in handloom weaving is considered to be a skill in providing for one's family, conserving the natural environment, and it is also an important milestone for adulthood. Timorese woven, handwoven cloth and its motives campaign for one's history, recorded knowledge, um, conceal uh, secret knowledge, and they also reveal uh, one's kinship and geographical. And, um, Mai addressed uh, the woman's body as a social ecological text. Um, and uh, it is specifically in the context of being, belonging, and becoming in uh, the Molo Timorese woman's world. Uh, it explores mythology and morality that dictates uh, a woman's work and um, how her cultures a woman's and and all the December generous due to economic and educational and in all kind of the modern how comes this from the cleanse um, which normally goes on in the community while a woman practices handloom weaving. All right, um, that is a recap of um, the presentations earlier. Uh, now I would like to um, uh, give the floor to Mama Aleta uh, for the closing remarks. Saya ingin mempersilahkan Mama Aleta untuk uh, memberikan uh, penutup. Terima kasih atas dukungan uh, yang begitu besar terhadap uh, para perempuan-perempuan tenunan yang ada di Timor dan khususnya di Molo dan uh, semangat kami untuk tetap mempertahankan tenun asli eh, Molo sebagai identitas eh, kami sebagai perempuan. Terima kasih Mama Aleta. Um, I would like to um, uh, I would like to give the floor to um, Siti Maimuna for uh, the Oh sorry the translation was just off. Um, uh, I was informed, so um, Mama Aleta um, gave her thanks um, for this opportunity to um, speak in this webinar and also for all the support um, that um, people here are giving uh, for the continuation of the practice of Molo Timorese handloom weaving. Um, the fact that you all are here are uh, giving weavers um, a reason to continue their craft and um, she would like to thank uh, you all for this opportunity. All right, I will now uh, give the floor to Mai uh, to give her concluding remarks. Mai, silakan. Uh, Bapak Ibu sekalian, terima kasih uh, juga pada penyelenggara uh, pada kesempatan yang sangat baik ini. Um, apa saya hanya ingin mengajak uh, melihat. Uh, tenun sekarang dengan cara yang berbeda begitu ya karena 
di apa di pakaian kita itu maka kemudian pengalaman uh, apa ketubuhan perempuan itu ada di sana juga gitu sehingga penghargaan kita menjadi lebih berbeda ada kemanusiaan di situ itu yang pertama yang kedua um, saya mengajak uh, bapak ibu untuk uh, apa menjadi bagian dari mama aletafan karena dengan begitu uh, itu salah satu cara untuk apa mem- melakukan regenerasi uh, pada para pemimpin-pemimpin perempuan untuk menyelamatkan uh, ruang hidup dan uh, apa kekayaan tenun uh, kita ke depan termasuk pengetahuan-pengetahuannya. Terima kasih. Mohon maaf jika ada kata yang tidak berkenan. Terima kasih. And um, uh, I will translate uh, for um, is translations on. If it's not, then I would like to um, uh, translate. Um, So Mai said, uh, thank you all for uh, being here and also for um, the support that you are giving. And uh, she would like to invite us all to now see uh, Molo Timori's handloom weaving um, from different eyes because when we wear uh, tenun, when we wear handloom woven cloth, then we are wearing the bodily experiences of the women who are creating uh, these works of art. And secondly, um, I would like to invite us all to uh, become part of the Mama Aleta Fund because our participation in it would um, uh, it would be very important for the regeneration of uh, the craft of uh, tenun or handloom weaving in Molo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. And uh, what inspirational presentations from two very inspirational women. Uh, I mean, we've learned so much in the space of uh, 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 about the role of women there, about the significance of their motives and so on. Uh, we also about the uh, current being faced by many Indonesian uh, artisans, and some were mentioned uh, is mining, uh, as uh, we heard in the Molo area, there's deforestation, and then there's the, there are government uh, policies which also uh, impact on, on these uh, art communities. So um, we do pay tribute not only to our two speakers today, but to all of those artisans that have participated in this uh, webinar series. And we, we do uh, admire their uh, persistence and their efforts to um, uh, keep their work sustainable, yeah? Uh, I'd like at this point to uh, personally thank Ibu Aleta and Ibu Siti Maimuna or Ibu Mai um, for giving up their time and for once again sharing uh, their experiences um, from uh, their homeland of Molo here. Yeah? And uh, hopefully they can inspire younger people from their area to continue with this tradition. I think this is a problem throughout many developing countries when the younger people become educated, they, they tend to move on. So thank you once again to our presenters and uh, to our moderator, Grace. Uh, very, very well done, very graceful. Thank you, Grace. And finally, to all of you who are listening today, if you have enjoyed this, please spread the word uh, and encourage your friends and acquaintances to, to join us uh, for uh, the remaining five webinars. Yeah, We're going until the middle of August and uh, we value your support. And uh, as you have heard, um, the funds go directly to the artisans and you will be supporting a very worthwhile cause. So, terima kasih dari Indonesian Heritage Society dan sampai bertemu lagi.